Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Grip Lock Preview Show for the European Open, the second major of the year. Took us a while to Super get to that, exciting. huh? Yeah, we're about to rattle <laughs> off some majors. We're like uh, over halfway through the season, and we've made it to the second major. It's going to go major, few more weeks, major, few more weeks, major to finish we'll out. Get a, I feel like we'll get an appropriate break between Worlds and USDGC, but these next two are going to be real fast because we're it's getting... two within a month, yeah. Yeah. Because today's July. It's about a month, it's about a month right on the right dot, right really. Yeah. On the dot. Mm-hmm. Um, the part of the European Open, though, is the President's Cup happens the day before, which means it happened this morning. So that's why we delayed the recording of the show a little bit, so that we could at least see what storylines develop. Basically, the President's Cup, if you're not aware, there's the Team USA versus Team Europe. There's People are picked based on their um, resumes, and then there's the fan vote that gets added as well. So really, the storylines, A, USA took it down. I think the USA is still undefeated in they the President's are. Cup. They are, 12 in a row. Um, this one was a lot more convincingly. Last year, What's I think we struggled a little bit. Um, yeah, but the real storyline is we just want to look at how do players look out there the day before the event. That's the storyline here. I just want to say the President's Cup is such a cool event. It is super fun. Like It's all-star, basically. The format is really cool, but it just doesn't really get a lot of attention. It does not, yeah. no. Partially because it's broadcasted in the morning on a Wednesday. It was at like 6 a.m. Wednesday morning, yeah. um, and it's only to DG and Pro. This yeah. whole event is only to DG and Pro, which if you're – I'm a PDJ member, so I already have the discount to the basic or standard, whichever one. So for me to upgrade this morning was only $6. I'll try to add a reminder Monday to remind all of you to go back down to standard because wow. obviously the Take play that. the play here is Stick get people <laughs> to Pro, and then people forget they're on Pro. And, Stick it to the man. Um because like I'm gonna remember Monday to go back down. Because like paying six dollars to watch the European Open, I would do that every year. Yeah, sure. That's a steal. Yeah. Um, paying twelve dollars a month for the rest of the year, I would not want to do. He wouldn't do so, it. So, regardless, key storylines: Ricky and Paul both seemed very comfortable. They played eighteen holes. They didn't play the full beast. They played like a nine-hole loop, and it was like split up. So they had nine in the morning, nine in the afternoon, and the afternoon round was match play, which can also affect how your scoring goes. But if you just look at the scores that are on PDGA Live, so you try to combine them into an 18-hole round, what you get is Ricky shooting a 9-under through those 18, Paul going 14-under through the 18. The front nine was actual just stroke plays. They're playing to be as good as possible, and you had Paul shoot 8-under, Rick shoot 6-under. Regardless, basically what I'm trying to say, both guys look fired up and ready for the major. Mm -hmm. Um, They look very ready to play. Gannon and A.B., a little more iffy, a little more touch and go. First first time looking at the course for at Gannon. least Gannon, yeah. Yes. No, A.B. obviously was there last yeah. year. He uh, yeah, we, literally on hole 16, oh, he, was there. he went OB this year OB and just got to have a par putt. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, Kristen looked really solid in singles, ended up losing her match to Ella Hansen. So mixed signals from Kristen there. Um, and like I said, they only played select holes. So these are just storylines. You kind of get a feel, but it never fully translates because especially this year, mm-hmm. we have the Beast being used for two rounds. This is the course that's played every year. Not much changes, if any changes, happened here with the exception of them ruining the entire course, lighting it all on fire, and saying this event sucks now. A little bit dramatic, oh. but hole 16 last year, bunker rule, creates so much drama. We have Anthony Barella, choke of the year, falling apart because the rule was you throw if you land in the bunker b-u-n-c-r if you land in the bunker you just re-throw without a stroke penalty until you get on the island you don't go to the island until you're on so you're just standing there re-throwing 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 and you're not going to get those discs unless you can sprint and get it back in 30 seconds mm-hmm. we tried that in a video very fun it's super um, hard so basically you're losing discs and it created an immense amount of drama both for A.B. and then for Corey Ellis, who had to step up after A.B. took whatever he took. Yeah. This year, they blew it all up. Basically, if you go O.B. off of the T, you move to drop zone one. If you go O.B. in the fairway or from drop zone one, you move to drop zone two. Drop zone two, wide open 45-foot putt. So, if you go drive in the fairway, second shot O.B., you have a 45-footer for par. Pretty lame. Making... If you're trying to play the hole well, the worst you'll take is a bogey. Yeah. So really, they took what the separation could be infinite, right? Tons of drama possibility on the 16th hole and made it where the biggest swing could be birdie to bogey. Maybe birdie to double if someone goes OB from the drop zone. It's pretty lame. It's pretty lame. It sucks. It's one of the worst changes of all time. Um, People on Twitter were saying it's because the PDGA thought the previous rule was unfair and they didn't want to have to grant bunker 
that thanks sounds to C tiers. Soft. Here's the thing: you don't have to grant grant bunker thanks to C tiers. Isn't You're it? The PDGA. Isn't it cute when they act like they can't do whatever they want? Yeah, like what the frick <laughs> like, are we talking about here? Just don't. It's a major. <laughs> it makes the major better. Why are we not doing yeah, it? Or better yet, just, okay, do it like USDGC and take away the ratings for yeah, one event. Cares? Nobody cares. No, and it makes the event so, weird. so much better. Because, like, realistically, last year, Anthony Barella probably ends up winning probably. the European Open. Yeah. And we don't have that dramatic storyline that happened. Oh, yeah. And that's just that simple. This year... Like I, I hate this. I hate everything about it. That hole was so unique. It had it was like the most iconic hole because of the storyline. It was something special in disc golf. There's still time to change. The t- we don't tee off for another like twelve <laughs> hours. Okay, we can right the wrong still. Let's do it, please. Bring I beg back of you. bunker. Like I just I it was such a cool rule. It's like they they did the same thing to USDGC hole seventeen a few yeah. years ago. Like what is so bad? They don't like to see about people suffer. Distance like let. The most fair thing you can do, if you want to talk about fair, is say you can't play on the island until you make the island. That's the most fair thing. Seems fair to me. Because now you have some players who are within an inch of the island that go to the drop zone and have some players who are 600 feet from the island that go to the drop zone. Why are both players going to the drop zone? That's not fair. Good point. What is fair is once you're on the island, you go to the island. I rest my case. PDGA, there's my fairness case. Let's make the change. They won't hear it. Come on, you got time. They will not hear it. I mean, the, the joy that would erupt from my heart if I woke up tomorrow and it was breaking news that the bunker rules reinstated. That would be crazy. It would fix everything. Everything. The entire world would be fixed if the bunker rules reinstated. I'd have to agree. Um, but other than that, no real change of the beast. Going to play awesome. It's, it's the be beast. It's the beast. They're also adding the monster at Tampere. How do I say it? Tampere. Tampere. They're also adding the monster at Tampere, which looks like a phen- phenomenal addition. to. This. Looks really good. Obviously, this is the... The host of worlds next year. The European Open will not exist. The World Championship will. Mm-hmm. Why can't they do both? You tell me. I don't know. But European Open won't exist. Worlds will. And these are the courses that, as of right now, are going to be played. So you can see they're kind of already testing because the monster adds a lot more woods in. I wouldn't necessarily call it a fully woodsy course, but I think it's going to play as if it is because the open holes have a lot of OB that still make it mm-hmm. punishing to go off the fairway. Yeah. And then when they get in the quote-unquote woods, it's like European woods where there's like still grass fairways, but it gets real tight. It's tight, it's tight and it's long. And from what I've seen, you get it. It's kind of like what we just saw at Crocole. You get in that rough, and all of a sudden you see it gets real dark because yeah. there's, it's thick. It's thick. Thick with trees. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> going to be really interesting to see the I, twist that adds to this. I it think, will not play like the same event it always has. No, I, I think the, the event's going to play a lot different and my take i mean th- this course looks really great and that's going to be the course that people fear coming into this event uh, that I, that's my opinion from what i've seen it looks very challenging i, I think that's if I'm not mistaken i think it goes the monster monster and then beast beast yeah i think you're going to see a lot of players um see some have some pretty serious hiccups on that monster course because it, it looks very challenging it does not look like it's going to score super easy you're going to have to be really on and throwing the disc well and there's plenty of opportunities with those greens to get bad breaks. Oh, yeah, that's the other so. thing that's crazy about this course, if you haven't seen it, is the greens, there's several greens that have been built up into these massive dunes with, like, multiple levels, and it's not, like, built up as in stonework. It's like dirt was brought in and then grass was planted to where it looks Pretty unreal, crazy. real, like a castle almost with a disc golf basket on top, but it's all grass. Greens are protected because even, even the ones that don't have any elevation like that are... You'll see a lot of guardian trees um, in the entrance. They they keep the entrances to a lot of the greens tight. They, they like to do that in Europe, it seems like. Um, you get to like the end of a, a dogleg par three, and it cuts into the woods, and there'll be kind of an entrance to the green. Um, yeah, it, it looks like a really fun course. I'm excited to see how that plays, and I, I think that there's a really good chance that if you get some of the players that we know can shred the beast, if they're able to succeed at this first course and get themselves a lead or near the top, it's going to be it's going to be a real confidence boost heading into familiar golf now, for the sure. The other thing that'll be an interesting storyline is the weather does not look like it's going to be cooperating. Love it. Um, rain on Thursday, thunderstorms on Friday, rain on Saturday. Finally, looks like it's going to clear up on Sunday, and there are pretty high chances of rain hopefully they're just like passing shower type stuff but when i looked at it it looks like a pretty consistent like 70 percent chance of rain in i don't mind a rainy european open yeah I, no, no, I, no. I, i'm down for i mean this is europe like they get the they get the weird weather like that I, i'm down for a like you got to grind it out type type event yeah 
So let's get into some storylines here, all right? Paul Macbeth loves this event, loves playing in Europe, just scorched the President's Cup. Yeah. What does that do to your opinion of him leading to this event? Well, it certainly helps. I think that he, you know, he lays down that nostalgia trap where it's like every year you for really any major tournament, but especially this one and Worlds, but honestly, this one probably being the, the biggest one, you get real excited about the possibility, oh, Paul put, is playing pretty well. He's owned this term in the past, but I think you have to be careful just because of this new addition of a course. This isn't going to be four rounds at a course that he's dominated historically. He's going to have to play half this event at a course he, he doesn't have the same level of experience on, and that is going to be challenging in length to some extent. Um, so, you know, if he's on, he's on, and he'll be competitive. And, you know, when it comes to these majors, he doesn't feel the same kind of pressure other players do, although maybe he's starting to apply that to himself. Um, but he, he definitely has a different level of focus that he switches on. So we'll find out uh, what version of Paul we see. But if we get a good, if we get a Paul's good game, he's going to be in contention. He, oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, no, I had the exact same thought of if we were going into a, the classic European Open four rounds at the Beast, I'd really like him. I don't know if it would quite make him my favorite, but he would be up there. Well, he won PCS last year, uh, right before the European Open. And obviously, you know, maybe there's an injury during the European Open or whatever, but that laid the foundation for us to be like, Paul is about to dominate and win a major, and then it just didn't happen. Yeah. So we've been we've seen this film before. Um, but when you add in the monster in addition to the beast, when you add the monster here in I think that course levels the playing field a little bit more because there's not that history, both in Paul's mind and the field's mind, of what Paul can do. Yeah. So, like, it, if we're just playing the beast across four rounds and Paul's in contention, like, if Paul can get himself through round one and round two where we're going into the beast and he's only two back, I like him there the most. Mm -hmm. If we had four rounds at the beast, what it does is we've seen historic comebacks from Paul multiple, multiple times. We've seen him destroy the beast multiple, multiple times. So when the field sees his name, there's a little bit of frightening there. Yeah. Right? With the monster, none of that exists. No one's played this course from the U.S. really on a stage like this. No one's played this course, period, on a stage like this. So that, I think, is a great equalizer. Um, he's still going to have the major Macbeth swagger. He's still chasing that Ken Climo record, one shy of it, him and Paige Pierce both. So, like, those are all things that are factors. You do like him more here just because it's a major and Paul does things at majors, but he's not my favorite by any means. Um, now, two players that need a major win for completely different reasons, every major that comes, this is the storyline. Ricky Wysocki, Calvin Heimberg. I'm going to ask you a different question this time around. Um, which player do you think is more likely to take this major down? I think everything points to Rick, and that's why I'm going to say Calvin, oh. um, because I think the course sets up fine for both of them. Um, but you actually talked about this on debate night. Ricky has had a really tough time getting off to a good start um, in majors, and playing an unfamiliar course, I think that probably hurts him a little bit more. Um, I think this is also this monster course could be one where. It could, if you're having early struggles, it's going to enhance those struggles. It's not going to be forgiving towards that. So I, I, I know his game's been very hot right now, uh, but there's a reason he struggled at majors, and it's not because he's not good at disc golf. I, I don't think that is. I, I think there's when it comes to these two players in particular, you have to look at things differently than any other event it, because the, the track record for long enough has been this way that you can't ignore it any longer. Um, my reasoning for Calvin is. I think he's just flying a little under the radar right now. He's been a bit quiet the last few months uh, since his last win. And uh, I haven't, I don't know, I haven't seen a lot from him recently. So I feel like maybe he's not getting as much chatter going into this event as somebody like Rick would be because of how well he's been playing. So I see an opportunity for Calvin to, to sneak into this one. And, and I think so mostly because I think he has a better chance of putting together four consistent rounds than Rick, and I think that's what it's going to take to win this event. When you think about bad weather um, and unknown courses, I don't see somebody exploding for three rounds with a bad one. I see a couple rounds of survival and then finishing maybe a little bit stronger, but but some consistency, and that's why I, I like Calvin. Yeah, um, what's funny is I'm using the same logic to lean towards Rick, mainly because on debate night, which debate night actually hasn't come out yet, funny enough, but on debate night, Brody brought up a really good point statistically that in majors, the first round kills Ricky. Mm -hmm. That Ricky shoots himself out of the event in that first round. Yeah. And I think that's where the monster is going to actually help Ricky's case. 
is starting at this unknown course, starting at a course that doesn't seem like it's going to score nearly the same as the Beast. It Good. seems like it's going to be a little tougher. I think that's actually going to help his case. I think it lowers his chance of shooting himself out of it. Um, and I think that if you get Rick near the lead as he heads into a course he's more familiar with, into a course he's more comfortable with, although he hasn't won a major at this course, he is familiar and comfortable with the Beast. If he can go into the weekend in contention, I like him. And if we're talking four rounds of consistency, I actually like Ricky more than Calvin there. Because when we see Calvin win, it's almost a different story where Calvin will go really good, really good, awful, really good, or really good, really good, bad. Whereas Rick, events he wins, he is more consistent across the line. So um, it's all going to be at the starting round if for Ricky, if history tells us anything. And that's why I think Ricky is a little bit more likely to win just because I think that the course switch up and all of that with no precedent actually helps his starting round chances. But if he shoots himself out of it in the first round, then he shoots himself out of it in the first round, and it's going to be one of those classic how far up can Ricky climb back. It's a coin flip at the end of the day. You got two guys. Both that, players have yeah, great chances. You got two guys who, but also zero percent chance <laughs> according to history. Yeah, exactly. They, they, if you just look at the numbers, they should be two of the favorites. But if you look at what they've been able to do in majors and how much they've been shackled by that pressure, I guess, then they have no chance. Yeah. <laughs> now, Andrew Presnell, only player in the field with a chance at a Grand Slam this year. <laughs> he reminded everyone of that on Twitter. Um, what do you actually think of his chances coming into the um, event? He, I slim to none. Obviously, I, I think he could maybe hang around at this first course, uh, just because it, he could hang around round one while everybody's feeling out the course. The guy who maybe keeps the disc in play could have an advantage, but I think there's going to be enough opportunity to attack and separate yourself on that course that I think by the end of round two, if he was in it, we won't be worried about it anymore. I'm not, I shouldn't say worried. I would be thrilled if Andrew Presnell won this event, um, but. I don't think it's going to happen. No, I think that where it all is going to fall apart is just the distance. It's far. And Andrew Presnell's come out multiple times and talked about, like, he just isn't, he doesn't throw the disc far. Yeah. And, like, especially when you get to the beast, that's an advantage. And when you're looking at the monster, even though it is technical, which, you know, points to Andrew, technical, it's long. Yeah. Points to distance throwers, it's long. So when I think you look at this tournament as a whole and try to digest it, I think the addition of the monster helps, but not enough. Yeah. So um, I would put his chances very, very low. But in his credit, we, everyone would put his chances very, very low at Champions Cup. Yeah. And he, he pulled that one off. Sure. But I do think this is a completely different tournament. Champions Cup is, is like nothing else. Yeah. yeah. So end of the day, now next year, Champions Cup will require distance. because ne yeah, Next year, Champions Cup window. will be like everything else. And we might see a first-time major winner again next year. Yeah. But um, it is interesting, though. You know, last year we had Corey Ellis win this. They, you know, it does open the door for a uh, – more interesting winner, although historically that hasn't really been true. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I also think just like the addition of this course helps Andrew Presnell, I think the addition of this course hurts Corey Ellis's chances. Of, and yeah. I don't even know, did Corey Ellis make the trip? Mm -hmm. Okay, because he was doing fundraising, trying yeah. to get out there. He's got to see time. I, I didn't know if he ended up getting the funds raised to get out there, but... Um, <laughs> Thank goodness. Do you agree that the addition of this course hurts Corey Ellis's chances, or do you think he has a, a solid shot at a repeat? No, it hurts him. Yeah, I'd say it hurts because I think he found a magic formula last year, and it's not the same formula this year. I would agree. Um, now, one player who found magic until he didn't last year, obviously Anthony Barella, every, on everyone's minds with what happened in 16. With the switch in hole 16, you mm -hmm. do have to think that's a slight confidence boost to Anthony Barella. One less thing to worry about. Because it's one less demon he's got to fight yeah. with this event. Where do you think he's at coming into this event, both mentally and in the scope of the field of, like, what are his chances of winning this thing? Yeah, it's tough to say. You know, when you this is such a defining moment of his season last year. Obviously, this season's looked way different leading up to this event. But you know, he he knows this event is the one that he should have won. Uh, it should have been a major victory for him, and that can do a, a number of things to you. I I feel like he is he's such a proven winner this year and a competitive driven guy that that like. I, I feel like he'll be able to channel that into a positive effect for his game and be very motivated. Um, but, you know, it, he's still got to play these new courses. I, I, I expect a normal tournament out of AB. So I would say it's likely, you know, his arm will, do, will fare very well at these courses. Uh, I think there will be a lot of times where he can throw mid or putter where other people can't. So I think top 10 is, is very reasonable, and it would not shock me to see him in contention to win this again. Um, but yeah, that, I'm not really, I'm not taking too much from what happened last year. I think it, 
whatever is going on in his mind, I think it'll just kind of balance out. And as long as he can settle in early and he's not super nervous about anything, um, I expect a no my normal expectations. Yeah, I don't. I think that similar to Coriolis, I think the addition of the monster hurts AB yeah. in the scope of the field. Yeah. Um, but with that being said, top 15 is my expectation. Like, I think he's going to be able to get himself in contention because the beast, we know he can play really well out there. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of guys that can play really well out there. The monster, we just don't know. Um, and because it could come down to maybe he can just throw that green Luna on 90% of the shots mm -hmm. and it, it maybe he's just going to tear it apart. Yeah. But just looking at the two courses and looking at the change, I just feel like it, it boosts. There's a, there's a list of guys who did well last year that I think that adding this course helps their cases, and AB's not on that list. Um, so, like I'm saying, he's going to be in contention. I'd be very surprised if, we, if, if he finishes outside the top 20. I'll be very surprised. I'm expecting him inside the top 15, probably top 10 finish. Um, but I do think that the, the monster is more so you know, what he's going to have to deal with more than just the mental – fight of what could have been last year mm -hmm. but that is definitely going to play a role is like every hole he's out here like he that ghost is still out there you know what i mean until he wins this tournament that will always haunt him yeah what that does to him time will tell a uh, player who doesn't have any ghosts out here gannon burr first time out here playing this tournament first time playing these courses yeah um obviously everyone's first time at the monster but with him not having experience tournament experience at the beast how much do you think that's a disadvantage for who I would consider the number one player in the world right now? Yeah, it's a disadvantage. Um, you know, there's a reason you see similar names pop up often because they don't make a ton of changes to the Beast until they ruin 16. Um, but they, they like to keep that course a similar theme. Uh, so, yeah, a lot of players who have had success there continue to. Uh, so the new course edition certainly helps him. Uh, and at the end of the day, yeah, he's, he's the best player in the world right now. He's the most consistent player all year. He's been insane. So while I don't think he is my pick to go out and win this event, he's going to keep it close. Like, he's going to stay near the top of that leaderboard. I think I can expect that from him. Yeah, no, I definitely I – don't, I don't think his experience is going to be what holds him back here because Gannon, I think, is very similar to Rick and that these first two rounds are going to set the stage for Especially the tournament. Especially in bad weather. If Gannon gets out of it and the weather sucks, like I can see him kind That's of That's what I'm over. worried about with him. Is I, I have similar expectations for him as AB, where I'm expecting Gannon in the top 15, in the top 10. Obviously, he's the best player in the world, one of the most consistent players. He's having one of the most consistent seasons of all time this year, so if you bet on his average, he's going to be in the top five. Um, but he's not my favorite out here. I, I think that... I just think there's a lot of things that just don't quite go his way when you're looking at the story of the tournament before we get into it that I'm expecting him in the top 10. That's where I'm expecting him. Will I be surprised if he's in the lead or in contention? Obviously not. He's the greatest player on the face of the earth right now, but that's where I'm expecting him. Now, on FPO, there's one storyline. Kristen Tatar absolutely dominated out here last year. So the question around this is actually, what's it going to take for someone to stop her this year? Um, it's going to take somebody's a game. I mean, Kristen is not invincible. We know this, um, she can have off events, but when you take two, two courses of this caliber that are designed, um, to be really, really premium, like difficult disc golf courses, I think it's going to take something really extra and it's going to take Kristen to really kind of shoot herself in the foot. I think, um, four rounds at, at these courses, it, it that just really favors her. Um, but there are other good players in the field, and you know you can't write off other players like Missy Gannon, who have uh, had success this season. Now it's been a while since th since they've faced off together. But um, yeah, I, I think it's 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 like any FPO event where it's it's Kristen's to, Kristen's event to lose. However, she's not indestructible, and no. if she comes out and she's struggling, uh, sometimes that snowballs with her. Sometimes it takes her a while to get things back on track, and. In the FPO game, those scores can fluctuate so much that, you know, if somebody's just playing consistent golf and Kristen Tatar takes an awful, awful round and then has to work, dig herself out of that, it might not be enough time to catch up. It just kind of depends on the timing of that. So um, definitely the favorite, most likely going to win this and get, you know, get her major total started for the year. But she's not indestructible. You have to remember that there, there is certainly going to be opportunity out there. Yeah, I think for... When I'm looking at this, what gives Kristen the advantage in, in these two courses is I think she a lot of times doesn't get caught up in going for things 
she plays her percentages very well. Yeah. And I think that's where these courses really favor someone who does that because if you have distance, which Kristen isn't the farthest thrower in the field, so players who have distance on her, they will get baited into going for shots that Kristen's not going to mess with. So this is very much a thrower's event. This is mm -hmm. a keep it in the fairway, take your chances when you can get them, and capitalize on the putts. So to me, the question of what will it take for someone to stop her this year is Evelina Solomon's putt to be on. Yeah. Because I think Evelina is going to be the player that gives herself as many or more looks than Kristen. She's the big threat. And it's just a question of can she convert? Totally. Spoiler alert, President's Cup. No. Um, there was some <laughs> yeah. very shaky putts during the President's Cup. Certainly was. So it doesn't really bode well for my confidence for Evelina going into it, but I think that is the key because Missy Gannon also in the President's Cup just didn't look great. Um, and I, Kristen, jet lag, Kristen jet lag. did look very solid. So I think it's going to be very hard for someone to topple Kristen, but I think if someone was going to, I think it's going to be Evelina Solonen, and I think it's going to be all contingent on her putt as it always is. Um, is there any other players on your radar, though? Well, you can't forget about Silva. Yes. Silva Sarnin um, obviously lost to Kristen last week, but it was a valiant effort, and I think there's a chance that uh, if she can continue, she's, she's continued to play well, you know. Um, so if she can continue to play well and Kristen doesn't have her best event, she'll be there. So it'll be interesting to see how she does. Now, as, he as we head into predictions, reminder that uh, majors are worth double, double big points. Week, big week. So very big week, and I need it because I'm at 57 and Trevor is at 71. It can happen. He, it can be flip right here, destroying though. destroying me on the Dark Horse pick. I'm going to so, do it again. Um, we're, we're locking in. We're going MPO first here. I, These are the hardest picks I don't, ever. I don't, like, I don't like what is on my paper. I hate my picks. But I'm sticking with it. Same. <laughs> Yeah, I don't. Oh, this, I, w I picked with gut. I, I picked with gut. Pick. I picked with gut. And That's crazy. I'm rolling with it because here's the deal: is there's been multiple times this season my gut has told me something, oh and my I've my gosh. brain has told me no, I think and that was my just gut some, was right. Some bad Fuji ate or something. So I'm locking with this. Third place, I want Kyle Klein. That's Came in second last year. No fair. one's talking about him. I think he's going to be just fine at the monster, and I Bro, know he can play the beast. The point separation is going to be crazy. Second place. I want Ricky Wysocki. Because of the top players in the world, I think Ricky's the most likely to get in the top three for me. Um, so I want him in there. So I got Ricky Wysocki. And then winning it, I'm, I'm doing it. I, winning it, I'm, yeah, taking, I saw you wrote. I'm taking Chris Dickerson. <laughs> he played really solid last year. He came Ooh. in eighth place. And I think the monster really is going to bode well for his game. And he's having a very good season overall. The dude has been living in the top ten when he's been playing. That's an ambitious pick. We have three so different. I want, I want Chris Dickerson. We have three different players. So this is going to be great. This is great. Um, watch, it'll be a three that we don't have. Um, I've got Paul McBeth in third. Yeah. I'm giving him I my, do it. my nostalgia bid. Because, frankly, he has been around the top five, top ten, you know, lately. So At like, times, yeah. it's not, it's not been no, like, it's not a crazy. Pick. It's not been insane. It's not like I feel like last year I, or in years past, even with Paul, I've just really just kind of thrown it out there. This year, I kind of feel like it makes a little more sense. Um, and he played really well at Presidents Cup. That didn't, that didn't hurt anything. Uh, I've got Gannonber in second. Because how often does he finish outside the top three? No, Not that's a much. Smart pick. Um, a smart person to make that pick. This is the one that you know I don't maybe really agree with as much, but I'm going to do it. It's Calvin Heinberg. I'm going to give him his first win. I had a gut feeling about him as well. That was a gut feeling. Well, I here's felt, the. I feel like he's he's coming in a little more hush hush than a lot of players right now. And where I you're could, smart is you have two of the top players in the world in your top yeah. three. So yeah. So it's I don't. It's ambitious from the sense that I've my top three is made up of a guy who's never won a major, a guy who's never played. It, these, this course, or either of them, um, and Paul McBeth, who has not been playing great. Um, so that there is ambitious picks, but I do have. I'm missing AB though. I'm also missing Rick. And like, I, I wish I could have a top five because like those two players, I I really want in there as well. FPO, I forgot to update mine, so I'm gonna have to go off the dome um, because shouldn't be too hard. It's, yeah, it's not gonna be hard. I want uh, Missy Gannon in third. Mm -hmm. I want Evelina Solonen in second, and I want Kristen Tatar to take it down. Copy paste. That I've got. There you go. So no separation in that division. That's fine. That's all right. MPO is going to be MPO, a lot, yeah, potentially. Yeah, and Dark Horse is worth four points. I can tell you for free, though, that MPO top three is going to end up being uh, – it's going to end up being it could be a AB, AB, Matteo, and who else did we not name that would be like – Nicholas. Nicholas Antela. Like, yeah. That will be the top three, and I'll be like, well – Nicholas was one that was like really <laughs> – I, I put Kyle Klein in over him, and I'm probably going to regret oh, that. Oh, man. Uh, Dark Horse, I went Ben Calloway. Played really solid I thought you were going to take year. Vino. I really thought you were going to take Vino. Nope. Ben. Okay. I took the defending champ, Corey Ellis. I, All right. I like, I like Ben Calloway against Corey Ellis. 
I would too at any other event. I'm hoping that Corey Ellis gets a huge nostalgia kick the, from the win and just What scares dominates. me with Corey Ellis is that the nostalgia kick can't come in until round He's three. He's got to survive the first two yeah. rounds. But so does Ben Calloway. So does Ben. But Ben doesn't have nostalgia. That dude, not nostalgic at all. No nostalgia, Ben. Nope. That's what he's known as. So. Yep. That's going to wrap it up. Be sure to watch some disc golf this weekend. Morning tee times, always a good time. This, these courses are incredible. The crowds are going to be phenomenal. It's free to get in over there, so there's going to be thousands of people out there, which always makes this event way more electric. Um, so it's going to be a ton of fun to watch, but if you don't feel like pain, that's okay. Tune in Monday to Griplock, and we'll tell you everything you missed. We'll see you there.